and I'd like to introduce Dr. Lewis Manfred. Dr. Lewis Manfred is currently an assistant professor of human development and family studies at the University of Missouri here in Columbia and serves as the director of research, education, and development at the MU Child Development Laboratory. He earned a PhD in applied development psychology from George Mason University in 2006. His research interests includes early learning and development, verbally mediated cognition, self-directed speech, and school readiness, particularly among vulnerable populations. Joining Dr. Manfred, we have Christina Squires, who is currently a PhD student in the development of human development and family studies also at the University of Missouri here in Columbia. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Child Development from California State University in Fresno. Her research interest includes the development of executive function and self-regulation among preschoolers. It is my honor to present to you Dr. Lewis Manfred and Christina Squires. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, we are going to speak um, about uh, the effects of homelessness oh, sorry, on the education of young children. Um, I wanted to slightly tweak the title just for, to give everyone a, a little bit of better sense of the focus what we're going to um, uh, narrow towards, um, and that is the impact of homelessness on uh, young children's school readiness and academic success specifically. Uh, so I'll go through the goals after we uh, do an introduction, but primarily we're going to look at the research that um, uh, examines or explores the impact of homelessness on early academic success or school readiness in preschool as well as during uh, elementary school. We're going to look at risk factors and we're also going to talk about protective factors um, or, or factors that can ameliorate the effects of um, homelessness and the risk associated with uh, such. So um, just as a quick introduction, uh, many of you um, are quite aware of this. Um, the National Center for Homelessness uh, Education has reported um, the most recent in 2010-11 school year that more than one million students uh, have been identified as, as homeless or highly mobile. Um, and this is a large increase, a 13% increase over the previous year. So the rate of uh, homelessness has been increasing um, quite alarmingly over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, this is particularly true, as you'll see, with um, families with children and, and those who have children who are younger than six. So we're talking about a very young population of children who are really moving into this homeless um, experience or homeless situation um, prior to entering school. And so it's really important to start to think about how that's going to impact uh, their, their learning when they're in uh, pre-kindergarten as well as kindergarten through uh, elementary school. Um, and, it, and it should be noted, as the last bullet um, here suggests, that this is um, one of the largest segments of homeless um, growth. So we're talking about approximately 34 percent um, of the population experiencing homelessness are um, these children within these families um, who are younger than six. So this is a very large um, social issue um, that we're facing in the United States. Um, part of um, why this is, this is important is, as many of us know, the um, experiences that we have during our early childhood years um, can have very broad negative effects that are long lasting. And so some of the things you can see here um, would be an impact on brain development and learning, um, as well as health and behavior problems. So children who are experiencing adverse effects similar to uh, homelessness may experience these types of of detriments early on that could actually change the trajectory um, by which they're able to learn and accomplish in uh, school. So we'll, we'll look at those as we get into the study. Um, uh, one of the clear um, uh, issues associated with homelessness and residential mobility uh, is going to be the disruption for schooling. Um, so children who are highly mobile are going to be less likely to attend school, therefore um, they may uh, be put, for that reason alone, at risk for poor or lower academic um, per achievement or performance. Um, there's also an implicit risk, um, in, when we talk in a bit about parents and the impact of parents, but there's an implicit risk of uh, children in this context not uh, developing a very strong sense of the importance of school uh, and schooling because they're moving around a lot, they might be moving schools, they may be losing friends because of this, et cetera. And so they, they tend to show a lower um, enjoyment of attending school as well. Okay, so. Um, the goals of what we want to accomplish here are to provide an overview first of the definitions of homelessness. And I, and I want to do this for a couple of reasons. 
Um, one, just to set the stage of what we're, what we're getting at, but two, as we'll get into the studies and the research exploring homelessness uh, and the impact on uh, children's uh, school readiness and academic performance, um, the dif different studies focus on different definitions and include different children in um, uh, their approach towards exploring these phenomena. So I think it's important to uh, set the stage for that. Um, we'll also explore the risk for, for uh, low academic performance that's associated with the homelessness, um, review the studies investigating this impact of homelessness on school readiness and academic success, and then again, finally, I wanted to conclude by highlighting protective factors or associative factors um, that can help ameliorate or lessen uh, the impact or the effect of uh, homelessness. Um, so first, when we think about homeless and homelessness, um, one of the, the generic definitions that anyone, I think, would probably um, think about is, is an individual that's experiencing any episode of time without permanent residence. Um, one thing I will mention, and, and again, this is true throughout, is this does not in any way uh, indicate a period of time. So this time could be a week, it could be a month, it could be six months, it could be a um, year or more. Um, but if anyone's experiencing any episode of that, they would be considered as having experienced homeless. Um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, and the Department of Education um, by the McKinney-Vento Act um, have specific criteria that I just wanted to review. Again, these are the criteria that studies will uh, focus on as they uh, look at and explore um, homelessness and the impact of that on, on academic success. Um, so the HUD definition, and this is just a quote from uh, the actual uh, act, as you will see, uh, focuses on those who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. And as you'll see in the, in the second bullet, uh, this portion here, um, the designations are primarily for those who are um, uh, taking nighttime residence in a shelter um, or a temporary um, accommodation. You can see welfare hotels, transitional housing for people, et cetera. Um, an institution that provides a temporary residence for individuals that are intended to be institutionalized, and then a public or private place not designated for ordinary use as a regular sleeping accommodation. Um, this is a definition that I think most uh, people will think about in terms of who would qualify um, as homeless. And again, I'll, I'll revert back to this, but a number, almost half of the studies will approach it in this way, looking at uh, kids who are in shelters at the time that they're conducting the research. Another way, the, the uh, education definition of looking at this uh, has many similar qualities as the HUD definition, but it expands that definition to include uh, a lot more uh, individuals and, and children who are referring. Um, if you can see in Part A, um, children and youth who are sharing the housing of other persons due to a loss of housing, economic hardship, similar reasons, uh, those that are living in motels, hotels, trailer parks, camping grounds, uh, those types of accommodations because of a lack of alternative uh, accommodations. Uh, also those living in emergency um, or transitional shelters, abandoned hospitals, awaiting foster care placement is another one. It's a lot of research with uh, child welfare and foster children. Um, a lot of those uh, children would actually qualify as homeless. Um, the second one, the B, very similar um, as previous, those you know, not designated as a regular sleeping accommodation. Um, C includes those living in cars, parks, public places, uh, et cetera. Um, one of the ones on there is substandard housing. So again, thinking about places that are not very uh, adequate for, for typical uh, sleep. Uh, and then including migrant children who qualify um, based on other um, definition components above. So you can see how the definition broadens these. Uh, and I just wanted to, to point out a couple of the differences here. I think that are significant. One is what's referred to often as the doubled up family. So if a family um, experiences homelessness due to a, lock, a loss of residence, they may move in with another family, friends, uh, or others. That would be a, considered a double up family. Um, those children in that um, family unit may not experience a change in their school if they're able to move into a local family, but they still would qualify under the ed definition um, uh, as being homeless. Um, also included is, is the temporary housing. So often, especially with those who have a, a lease agreement, if they are evicted, often it takes a month or two to sign another lease. They may live in a motel or hotel temporarily. Uh, during that time period, that one or two months, um, they would also qualify as, as homeless under the, the education uh, definition. There is an approximate 72% uh, increase in identification of children who are experiencing homelessness based on the ED definition compared to the HUD definition. That's an extremely large number. 
Um, so if you think, go back to the total numbers of students that are experiencing homelessness, this is a large number. And, and again, it's, it's um, partially due to the uh, allowance of the education definition to include those who have been uprooted from a permanent resident who are uh, in a transient state, who are, who are moving or highly mobile uh, in, in terms of that. So I've mentioned before, but just to again highlight this, um, we'll come back to it, but um, when, when looking at research findings and when thinking about the impact of homelessness, these definitions are going to have a large uh, impact. Uh, those studies that focus on children who are based on uh, the HUD definition that might be in shelters um, may be experiencing a, something that's a little bit more traumatic if they're four or five years old and they move from a home to a shelter to a shelter to a hotel to a shelter versus somebody who moves in with a friend. It may not be as traumatic. And so, so one of the things just to keep in mind um, when looking at this is some research does not find differences, some finds differences um, that the definition and the approach may uh, have an effect. So I wanted to, to shift into uh, looking at risk factors that are associated with this. And um, I'm just trying to summarize here the different ways in which people will uh, think about and, and articulate risk that's associated um, with homelessness. Um, specifically, it's, it's thinking of risk towards lower or uh, detrimental academic performance. Um, the views that are here, and I just want to go through them if, uh, one by one, um, one would be that it's, it has an acute effect, and this would indicate or, or mean that uh, after or around the time of the homeless experience, um, you'd see a detriment towards academic performance, but that child would sort of uh, bounce back after a, a specific uh, time or a set time period. Um, some studies have looked at that in terms of a year lag and have found that after a year, depending on the length of time at the homeless experience, that some children would um, not show the same sort of negative effects that they may have uh, um, immediately um, during that homeless experience. Um, another perspective is that there's a chronic effect, that this is a long-lasting or long-term effect that's going to follow the child uh, throughout their education experience. Um, there's a couple ways of looking at this, one being that um, the actual experience has altered or changed something about that individual's view towards school or towards schooling. Um, such that they are just consistently not trying to achieve or not trying to learn or not trying to perform. Um, another is that the, they miss foundational uh, knowledge during that time period where they are dealing with these other uh, issues related to the, the current um, homelessness situation uh, and therefore are missing things and are just not able to catch up in the, in the climate of the educational system. Um, one way, and this is becoming more and more popular, and we'll look at this um, in the research, but is an income risk continuum. Uh, the conception here is that as you move from um, above poverty to near poverty to poverty, that when you get to homeless, homeless really represents another level or unit level decrease in terms of income and income risk. So with lower income, there's lower resources or limited resources, um, and there's other factors associated. And as you move towards homeless, the idea is that those become a little bit more intensified. Um, so there's even fewer resources, and there's even um, fewer opportunities. Um, and that's one way of, of thinking about it. A different way of thinking about it, and the, the last way I have here, is more of an additive, and, and some approach as a cumulative risk approach. Um, and that is a, an approach that the experiences of homelessness adds unique or new risk for children. So um, because of the experience of homeless, there are uh, uh, experiences or um, issues that arise that are independent of the poverty itself. And so you might think of mobility or instability of residents or having personal ownership of things like a bedroom or, or material items that may have uh, been sold or put into a storage unit or something to that effect. Um, so these are a, another way of looking at it. One thing I'd, I'd like to just stress before we, we look into some of these a little bit closer is that these approaches do not necessarily um, need to be thought of as mutually exclusive. So a child may experience acute uh, risk, so you see a, a larger deficit of, uh, in their active performance as a result of the homeless experience, but over time um, that risk still is there. It may bounce back somewhat, but it's still there compared to other children. They're showing the effect um, of long lasting. So um, I wanted to just give a little bit more information on the last two that are up there, the income risk continuum and the, the additive, uh, just to give you sort of a, an idea of how this uh, might look. Um, 
as I've mentioned, the, and the, the graphic here would represent this income risk continuum, that it's, a, it's another unit of risk. And so if you see how the income or resources um, on the bottom axis, the x-axis here, increases over time, uh, you'll see that the amount of risk would decrease. And the idea is that it is related to, at least from that perspective, that it's related to um, the amount of, of resources available due to the amount of income that's available. Um, the other uh, way of thinking about it, and I wanted to put these both here um, because you may find that this uh, effect is true, but the reason for this effect is not that they have even you know, more limited resources and that's causing more risk, but that it's an additive or a different set of unique factors that just looks like an additive risk or a cumulative risk, I should say. So, um, if we're adding the instability and the mobility and it's creating other factors, that may create lower academic performance for other reasons or for reasons other than the income or the resource depletion. So we may see an effect like this, but it doesn't necessarily rule out uh, or limit an additive uh, risk perspective. So um, as we're looking at the data, um, just something to think about in terms of how um, we conceptualize the risk, whoop, the risk that's associated there. Okay. Um, there have been a uh, number of studies um, that have looked at risk associated with um, homelessness, uh, and they're looking at this in independent, if you will, of academic performance, but as related to academic performance, and I wanted to um, share that. What a lot of these uh, studies uh, have found in the approach to these studies um, is that homeless uh, children or children experiencing homelessness um, when they're matched with a housed counterpart who has similar socio-demographic factors, um, and, the, you know, and there's, this is not always perfect and by any means, but they're trying to limit the factors that are different between the groups, save the factor of one is experiencing homelessness and one is still housed. Um, they're finding that children, parents, teachers, and others are reporting a different type of risk uh, and different type of risk factors. Um, associated with those that are experiencing uh, the homelessness, other than poverty. So both groups seem to have a similar set of risks uh, in terms of poverty. These are uh, things that you uh, are probably aware of, but limited resources, low education uh, from parent education, more likely to have single parenting, uh, more likely to be exposed to violence, poor nutrition, uh, limited or no health care um, is, is another common uh, risk. This is something that um, folks have found is shared among those experiencing homelessness and those that are housed that are all, um, again, socio-demographically similar, particularly in terms of uh, income-related factors. Um, when they started to get into those that are experiencing homelessness, um, there are a list of other um, risk factors, and again, things that you may expect, um, that those experiencing the homelessness had or showed or, or showed that they were dealing with that those in poverty weren't necessarily dealing with, um, at least consistently. Um, these, uh, as the first bullet under added risk points, um, are generally related to the residential mobility um, and uh, parenting factors or parenting fa uh, practices um, that the, the children are experiencing. Um, so uh, just some of the things that are listed here, limited relationships. Um, this is not just within um, a school context or a friendship context but also within neighborhood contacts, within broader family contacts, um, in other contexts, um, children are showing limited uh, relationships. Increased stress um, uh, is an obvious one, I think. Uh, reduction in feelings of ownership, property, or, or feeling like you, you have um, something that, that is personally um, uh, yours as, a, as an individual. Uh, inconsistent access to health care. Uh, when they have it, inconsistent access to social services, uh, lower parental warmth and cognitive stimulation. Um, again, expected as the parents are struggling with this home's experience, uh, they're doing less in terms of stimulating their children and providing experiences and, and uh, opportunities um, for, for cognitive stimulation. Uh, disruptions in educational experience is very common, so moving from school to school or program to program. Um, and as we'll see, one of the, the more important um, factors is not consistently going to school, missing a lot of school uh, is one that, that comes up. Um, and that is uh, uh, also a disruption to educational experience. And also just a discontinuity in care uh, and schooling. Um, and so, you know, imagining lessons that are progressing along in a school environment and then a child misses two or two weeks of school and they're, they're having those 
large discontinuities and disruptions uh, in that. So it seems from the, the research just exploring risk factors and, and um, asking parents about them uh, that the children who are experiencing uh, homelessness are going to have a unique set of risk factors that, and if you look at a lot of these, you can probably surmise how they associate with learning and associate with school readiness skills um, that would one would expect that they would have a, a probably a strong difference between these matched counterparts who are only experiencing uh, the, the risk associated with, with poverty. Any questions at this point? <laughs> I have a question. Yes, it's not related to what you just said, but I like your research. Is that available? Of course. Is your research available? Yeah, and a lot of what, what we're doing here is a summary of, so we've written um, papers, and actually I think the Head Start has posted a lot of this um, up on their website, yeah, but I also am happy to email it and happy to send it to you. Okay, yeah, I would appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely would. Yeah, nice school board presentation. Yeah, certainly. Yes, ma'am. Um, a lot of times it's measured as uh, self-report from the parent, was often if they're filling out a survey about um, specific behaviors in which they engage with their child and they're, they're self-reporting um, a lower amount. Um, it also is, uh, in a couple studies, they had observations, so they had the children work with the, I'm sorry, the parents work with the children and they observed them for a half hour and then uh, two coders would, would code the, um, the amount. But, um, uh, I will also say there, there are times where there's a closer connection with the school that teachers have also reported on uh, these factors uh, as well. Um, generally, uh, they, the three ways are, are usually fairly highly correlated um, depending, again, if it's a, uh, there was a study where the, they did this with the teachers after a month of being at school and the teachers were, they were very biased in their, their estimation where the other two were a little more accurate, but other than that, um, a lot of times they are, they are fairly, fairly good. You will probably get into the intervention techniques, will you not? Yes, we'll get into, yeah, so what we're looking at. Okay, um, so the next part, and I, I just wanted to pause there because we're going to start to look at how we approached, um, so essentially we approached this as a meta-analysis of the studies um, that were conducted to look at the impact of homelessness on school readiness and academic performance. As you'll see, there are very limited and almost disappointingly limited uh, number of studies that really are getting at um, this, uh, give, especially given that, that it's such an important topic. Um, so we're more uh, completed sort of a qualitative or critical analysis um, based on the few. And so I'd like to uh, go through and present those here. Um, just to get everyone on the same page, the inclusion criteria for the studies um, were that the studies were examining a variable or a factor looking at those children who are experiencing homelessness and we're looking at a, a group of children who are not experiencing homelessness. And in, and in a lot of cases, that was a socio-demographically matched or, and or, um, that was a, a general population of, of individual students that were in a similar situation. Um, and I just want to state, if anyone has, has looked at this, there's, there are studies, there are plenty of studies that have looked at within a group of homeless uh, children and are looking at how they're performing and how they're moving forward. Um, those studies were not included in this in that they did not have a comparison to a non-homeless group, therefore we can't really look at the impact of homelessness on it. There's no factor to look at. Um, but there are uh, information in, the, in some of these slides later on that we'll talk about uh, particularly getting at what are the protective factors and what are the things that uh, promote uh, resilience in children who are experiencing homelessness. So um, that's one. Uh, two, um, we did limit the age range uh, to the sort of earlier education. Um, this would include early child education, so school readiness type of, of measures, as well as elementary school, and we went through fifth grade. Um, there are a, a host of other studies in middle, middle schools or high schools and all those, but those were not included in this. We were focusing on the uh, younger age groups. Um, and then we looked at the outcome factors, and there were various um, outcome factors that you'll see that were related to school readiness measured by different uh, measures, uh, as well as academic success. And so some of these may have been teacher reports, some of them may have been a standardized test, um, some of them are screening, some of them are full assessments, and things like this. So um, we tried to organize those at least that they had school readiness or academic success type variables. Um, and we were friendly with our broadness there. 
Um, so some of them were just teacher report of how's the child doing, and they say pretty good. And academically, we took that. Um, those that were exploring socio-emotional rearing practices, environmental outcome variables, and these kind of things, um, again, helped inform the overall picture, but these weren't included in the analysis, um, so we really wanted to focus on the academic uh, outcomes and the academic performance uh, of them. Um, as you'll see in the next few slides, um, the organization of, of data includes um, trying to organize by sampling technique. Um, and this would include how they went about getting those data. Did they go out and find individuals who are homeless? Did they go out and ask others to provide them with data that was previously collected or gathered about, about homelessness? Um, the size of the sample, and, and you'll see this um, very quickly, there are basically two types of studies. There are small studies with under 200 participants, and usually under 100 of, of those in homeless. And then there are very large, over 8,500 sort of administrative secondary data studies. Um, nothing really in between. Location of study was something that we found uh, was something of interest. And again, as you're interpreting, you'll find that there are groups of studies in, in specific cities. Um, and just something to keep in mind. Um, we also, again, as I mentioned, went through the outcome measures. Um, and then we, we tried to compare findings. What most of the studies uh, focused on, as I've mentioned, is a comparison to a general population of students or other children. Uh, or or and or, I should say, a comparison to the socio-demographically matched um, house children. So we, we tried to make um, those comparisons um, uh, clear. Um, we went a, uh, took an approach, and I'll be presenting it this way, by the different age groups. Um, the, the elementary sort of measures of academic achievement were very, um, often were standardized measures. Uh, that were very different from those school readiness measures that were used in the preschool, um, and so we separated those. Um, further, the measures that were often in elementary school involved second, third, fourth, fifth grade a lot of times. They were really looking at what the school supplied as far as an academic uh, measure, um, rather than collecting their own or trying to find other uh, measures that the early childhood um, groups did. So, um, for the early childhood, so for those that are looking at preschoolers, um, the age groups here. Those that have comparison groups with homeless and housed are two. So this is how limited, when I say there's a limited uh, amount of studies. Um, there was a study from uh, Riscola in 1991 and then Scheingart in 1995 uh, that looked at uh, the preschoolers um, there. Um, you can see the, the uh, approach um, was to basically uh, go to uh, homeless shelters and uh, recruit participants that way. And so when families would come in, when they had young children, uh, they would ask those young children uh, and parents, excuse me, I should say that, uh, to be a part of the um, of this study. Um, so the outcome measures are a little bit different. There's the, um, the early screening inventory, the ESI, and then there's the uh, wide range achievement test uh, that's used. So one's a very quick screener and one's a very more comprehensive um, uh, study, uh, I'm sorry, assessment. Uh, if you look over here, um, so we did a comparison. What the first study here found um, was that those that were experiencing homelessness performed lower on the, the rate than the general population that they were uh, making a comparison to. Um, in this case, with the, the rate, they were using the standardized uh, or normed population that came with the test. And so those values, when they made that, that comparison, uh, that was actually fairly common for the others that used the rate uh, with elementary school. Um, they also found that the 83 homeless and the 45 housed uh, socio-demographically comparison group, that those that were experiencing homelessness did perform lower, significantly lower uh, than those in the uh, comparison group. Um, in, that was in Philadelphia. Here in New York, um, the Scheidengard, with the different assessment, did not find uh, the same thing with regard to the socio-demographic comparison group. So, um, right off the bat, and these are really the two studies that have these clear distinction of groups, uh, it seems that um, we already have uh, some inconsistent findings in terms of the impact uh, of homelessness, at least with regard to a socio-demographic. Um, so it seems at least uh, possible to conclude, uh, and again, I'm going to be a little tentative here with two studies, it's, it's pretty limited, um, but it's at least possible to conclude that those preschoolers experiencing homelessness um, and these are primarily three to five year olds in both of these studies, um, have lower school readiness compared to a general population of children of, of a similar uh, age. 
but it's pretty inconsistent and, and really there's just too few studies to draw conclusions. So it's possible that they also showed a, a difference, a, a lower performance on measures um, related to a housed socio-demographically uh, matched group. Um, but it's also pop possible that the methodological differences between the studies sort of led to those findings. So it's a little tentative. Um, but I do want to just set that as a stage that we already have at least um, a difference between the general population and, and there's a little bit of tentativeness there. Um, this is an area, and I, I will highlight this um, here, is that as we move forward and we start to understand um, the impact of homelessness on children, there really needs to be more focused research. With two studies, both of them in the 90s and early 90s, this is 20, year, 20 plus years ago, um, go back to even the points at the introduction that I'm trying to make there is that this is a time where it's really influential and really important in terms of the development. So if they are showing these deficits there, um, really understanding that and trying to understand how to improve that is a, it seems to be a very important uh, outcome. Um, next uh, are, and I'm splitting the elementary just in terms of the slides into the small elementary based studies and then the next slide will be the large elementary studies and there are six of each. Uh, again, that met all the, the criteria there. Um, what you'll, you'll notice um, first across the, the cities is that these do represent different locations. So you have New York, you have uh, Philly, uh, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, Worcester, Mass, um, as well as Madison, Wisconsin. So they're representing different uh, locations. Uh, a lot of these um, studies, again, are getting somewhere close to 100 or a little over 100 or a little under. Uh, uh, homeless children and they're trying to get a match socio-demographic group to compare those two. Um, and you can also see that all of the um, reported age ranges at least are fairly similar. Six to 11 years is going to be basically all of elementary school. Um, and so this is spanning across the elementary school and they're including children of any of these uh, ages or grades in their, in their research. Um, you can see that the first three are using the rat again. Um, the, the next two are using the Westler Individual Achievement Test. Uh, this is the screening version. Uh, and then the last one here is using the uh, CBCL, the Child Behavior Checklist Teacher, which includes a report of uh, academic performance. As you go through these, these findings here, uh, in the first two, and uh, I really should note, notice the difference uh, in per, uh, number of individuals and everything else across is non-existent because they basically pulled from the same uh, set of, of kids in the same set of data, so um, essentially finding the exact same thing. Um, uh, they just did a different approach, but um, those that were experiencing homeless were uh, lower, significantly lower than an artificial, and I, and I put that there, uh, socio-demographic comparison group. I say it's artificial, and I'll show you some of the, the figures from that, but artificial in that they tried to match, but they weren't able to, so they had higher parental education, they had uh, lower attendance, or I'm sorry, absenteeism, uh, they had uh, more likely to be from uh, uh, two-parent homes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they weren't really able to do a good job. They tried to control for all of those things in their statistical analysis, hence the uh, sort of artificial uh, group. But they did find uh, that difference. Uh, the next one, the Rescola, which was also did in a preschool, they also included an elementary age. They found no differences. Um, there, uh, Mastin found a difference in Minnesota um, compared to the uh, general population, but again, she used a standardized sample rather than collecting original data, so it's possible there's something about the difference between a national sample and that sample in Minnesota. Um, just uh, something to, to consider. Um, Buckner and Worcester found uh, no difference, and then in, in uh, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, they also found a difference between the general population. So these, these are a little um, less consistent than we might expect. Um, and, a, and a little curious about where, where we're finding. So some are showing that the, the demographically matched or lower, some are showing that it's lower than the general population, and some are so, showing uh, no difference uh, in performance. Um, something to, to just keep in mind at, um, at the bottom here, um, these studies, these small studies and all of these um, that are here collected data from shelters. So they all went to a shelter in their local area, they all uh, recruited participants, um, which means the participants volunteered to be a part of their study, um, and uh, you know they, they thereby followed uh, a HUD definition because they were all in, in, in shelters. Um, and I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but those that volunteer for a study in a case like this with such a, a uh, you know a 
a personal and an intense topic, maybe those who felt like they were going to transition out of it and it wasn't going to have as bad of an effect, which might be why there's not a, a huge difference. You know, I'm curious, if these were all done in the shelter, that's when people, are, when the, the youth are the most stable, the most stable. And so you're not really getting the PTSD effect on their functioning regarding an episode of homelessness until yeah. You know, some period of time of being out of that situation. Yeah. One, one thing to think about, too, when you, when you consider youth that are ex experiencing, and thinking of, of a, maybe 11 and through adolescence, um, a lot of those children who are in the older group are experiencing homelessness on the street. Um, most of the children in here are not experiencing that. They're moving from a house directly into a shelter. They're moving from a house directly into a thing. And so they're not getting this sort of on the street same type of experience, which is not true of the of youth um, focus, where they find that the majority are having a lot of those experiences. Um, There's no, nobody really capturing the housing and stability component, though, of homelessness. And the transientness, and it's, it's not that they move from this stable environment to this stable mm -hmm. environment, which is a shelter now. Right. But but really looking at that multiple effects where nobody's really tracking the frequency of change in housing addresses, yes. which I think would have much more impact. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and, you know, we started actually, of the last four years, we're putting together a, a data set for children that are um, in child welfare, and we're looking at the transient nation, nature of it, and it is a very large... Uh, piece. I mean, a lot of children go from one to the next, and it's almost a, you know, it could be A, B, A, B, A, B, and others are going A, B, C, D, E, F, um, and, it, and it has a big difference on how they're experiencing, and, and um, you know, when you think of acute effects or chronic effects, um, you know, it, it really does have a direct impact. Well, I was kind of on a similar page to you, but my thought is, you know, this, is, this was 1996, 2001, <laughs> Yourself, I've said earlier, that a significant increase in homelessness among our yeah, youth. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so that is a totally different generation than what we're working with now. So the facts that I see in schools with young kids for behavior, the yeah. post traumatic stress disorder, and other issues as drastic. Yes. So. And that is such an important point that the change, and you see a lot of the increase related to the economic changes that have, that have occurred, you know, 2004, 5, 6, 7 and everything, has really changed. And part of the, the reason that you see all these younger children experiencing homeless is because of that change, um, loss of jobs, et cetera, et cetera, that occurred. I mean, um, that's the that, effect to this. Right. But this generation right there is what are having babies. I was just going to say, it's a, it's a different... And it's a different effect completely. Absolutely. It's something that absolutely can think of. And that's why, and again, I, I try to put the years here and I try to, to get everyone to think about this because that's such an important factor. We're trying to make decisions and move this forward, but we're talking about 15, 20 years and, and really to try to get uh, people on but board with, with looking at, yeah. Have you uh, taken into consideration or have they looked at the effect of automation, robotics, in, in relationship to job and homelessness, or lack thereof? Because that's the biggest thing that I've seen. Everything I've read is the impact of automation and displacement of workers for jobs. Uh, Whether it be middle class or lower class. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say, displacement of jobs I've seen um, when people are, are thinking. I, I haven't seen anything directly related to automation or as a specific cause of, but, but the point of you're seeing more uh, families that were in a middle class who are now uh, being moved out. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. When you shift to the large studies, and when I say large, please note those numbers of participants. We've gone from 100 to 200 to 8,500, 10, 14, 24,000, 26,000, et cetera. Um, these are the newer studies. And these studies are focusing on using what is referred to as administrative data. They're going to the school districts. They're asking them for the data related to um, academic performance and success, success in a school. You'll note that, again, most of these are now looking at third grade or second grade, but primarily looking in that third grade. This is when the high stakes tests are. These are the data that they're using um, to, to explore. So it's already collected data. They're trying to get uh, full districts. Um, they're also using 
depending on where it is, and you notice that, notice that we have Minnesota and Philadelphia, and that's uh, what we have. Philadelphia has a, a system called KIDS. It's a KIDS integrated data system uh, in which they integrate the school data with different health and different uh, justice data um, around uh, Philadelphia, and they're trying to pull information. They have a little bit more information in Philadelphia on whether uh, a, ch a family of, the, of that child is related um, registered for or was registered at a shelter, so they can get down to that level. Um, whereas in Minnesota, they more have a checkbox that says, at some point during this large time period of elementary school, the child experienced homelessness or, or high mobility. Um, they have that sort of checkbox um, there. Um, so it's a different approach. It's a very different approach than going into a shelter. These studies are therefore really following this ed definition um, here. The school district follows that definition as they should, um, and they're following that uh, definition. These are a lot uh, larger studies, uh, and they're, they're using, uh, uh, again, the, the larger standardized. So you have the, the Northwest um, Achievement Levels Test, the NALT, um, and then the Terra Nova, um, which is an achievement test uh, that's used in Philadelphia. The Phil PSSA and the Philadelphia Schools, um, can't remember the other uh, assessment, uh, includes the Terra Nova as well. So we're looking at very similar outcomes here from these two different cities as well. And you'll see on the right, all of these uh, studies are finding that children experiencing homelessness are performing lower on average uh, than uh, the sociodemographic comparison groups and I'm going to have to put that a little bit in quotes right now, um, compared to the general population. The way that these data are collected are, again, they have sort of a checkbox of those experiencing homelessness. The comparison groups are uh, in the following order, and I have a, a graph to, to show what it looks like, but they are um, those that are um, in the free lunch program, those that are on a reduced lunch program, those that are in neither. And so they're using those as sort of a proxy um, estimate of what might be a uh, income or socio-demographic based on income comparison. Um, so given that, they're really taking an approach, and you can almost see the setup for that income risk setup where you're going from those experiencing homelessness, those in the free lunch that are 130 percent or lower on the poverty line, those that are in reduced lunch, 130 to 185 percent, and then those above 185 percent who are not in the free lunch program. So they're, they're taking that approach uh, to that. Um, the other thing, too, and I, just to mention, and, and it's just something to think about, the last three are all from Tuzo's um, his work. The first three are all Ann Mastin's work. These are all uh, students that were in her lab doing uh, dissertation. So again, it's a, it's a similar uh, perspective. Um, and I only mention that because it, it, again, concerns me that only two cities and two labs or two people are really focusing on this. Um, I, I did four years before I came here in Miami. We had many, many meetings I was a part of, of trying to create these data systems, integrate this, and it just could never fly. It never got off the ground. Uh, those that were working in the health system didn't want to share the data because they were nervous we would judge them and those in the justice and everything. So it's a matter of the data are there, um, you know, can more cities, more labs, more people get on board and doing that. And I'm sort of plugging that here in Missouri, if I, <laughs> if I may. Um, when you look at the outcome um, here, um, when you look, and sorry, I'm grouping both the small and the larger together, it produces a, a less clear outcome in terms of the effect of homelessness um, in terms of the sociodemographically compared group. Remember, the smaller studies did not find very consistent. It seems to be at least very consistent um, in the larger studies, they all found an effect, but if you look at the summary of, of the small studies, uh, two found no effect, two found only a difference with the general population, and two found, uh, did find a difference with those in the, in the counterpart. So um, how do we, in, you know, interpret this and how do we look at this? And I'm just going to throw this out there because we don't have time to really get into all of these, but it's possible that the sample size of the power of analysis is just different. The small studies are under 200, the larger over 8,500. If you remember your statistics courses, that creates an enormous difference in whether or not you're able to detect an effect that could be there. So the effect could be there, but it's not detectable in the smaller studies. Um, the approach and definitions are also different. So in the smaller studies, they're approaching the individuals that are in shelters, and it may be a, a difference in terms of their stability. Um, they're also then approaching a group of students not in the shelters that are experiencing, they're trying to match them overtly on the same sociodemographics. And the larger studies they're not doing that, they're using a, a, the free lunch and suggesting that those that have free lunch are experiencing something similar to those that are homeless except for the homeless variable. 
And that's, it's not a balanced uh, equation, if you, if you will. Um, so it's, it's really taking this administrative, and it, and it almost implicitly is taking this income risk uh, continuum approach to how they are looking at and exploring, uh, exploring those data. So as far as uh, uh, conclusions from, from those particular studies, um, as I've mentioned, I, I feel pretty comfortable. Uh, we've, we've talked over this and looked over these various times that we feel very, fairly comfortable when you look at the larger group of studies uh, that we would find um, and that the homeless population is scoring lower than the general population. Um, however, I'm a little hesitant uh, to make such a conclusion with regard to the socio-demographic. I'm hesitant because of, of how the, they're defined in the larger studies. I'm also hesitant um, because of the limit in, in terms of research and limit in terms of approach. Um, if we put those 12 studies into a meta-analysis, the, the, the sample size is going to drive the, the analysis. So those that have the very large are going to win out in terms of power. And so uh, any, any between study analysis is going to show those effects. But again, just looking at them and thinking about them, it seems like there needs to, to really be some more uh, research that really gets at that. One thing I think is also very important to, to note uh, and this, these sort of findings and these ideas that are in the, the bottom uh, section here are coming out of the, large, uh, the larger studies. What they're finding is impressive resilience. Uh, so Herb has found uh, about 45% of those that had experienced homelessness at some point during elementary school were um, showing a typical range on their academic um, uh, tests, on their academic um, high stakes tests as they had. So that's, that's impeccable um, uh, resilience. Um, again, the definition was that at any point, and so there, there were, for some of these studies, an average of only three weeks um, of experiencing any type of homelessness. Um, and so it may have happened in kindergarten, and now they're doing the test in third grade. So it may be the f demonstration of a less chronic effect. Um, there was, uh, the, I'll show you this in a second, but they did do analyses to look at acute and chronic effects um, and did show some, some for that. But this is an important um, thing to think about, um, is this, this within the homeless group variance and why uh, almost half of the children are really sort of recovering and, and bouncing back um, and, and performing at typical levels versus the others. Is it the degree to which they experience, the length of time, the type of uh, transient, the age they were, um, uh, the social support they had from others in the community or in their neighborhood or, or other things like that. Um, so just something to think about. Um, and again, I always do this and I don't have time, but I'd like to just posit that, you know, if uh, we were to experience, and I can just use myself and my family at homelessness, there are neighbors, friends, or others that I may be able to go through to. I have brothers and parents and everyone else that I can go and, and lean on for support. Um, that may represent some of those that are showing resilience. Again, they have that broader sense of social support. I can keep my kids in the same school district um, as I move forward, and others may not. And so they don't have the variables and the, the ability to drill down to that level and, and look at that. So it's something that really, really, I think, needs to happen as, as people move forward uh, in this. So there are evidence of acute effect. I'll just quickly show you, show you a couple things. Um, so from research in Minnesota, they found that there was a slowing or slowing down for the effect of homeless. So um, wherever the, the experience occurred, let's just say it was in first grade, they showed that there was a larger effect and that that, sorry, you're probably backwards, that that dwindled down a little bit um, uh, over time. It's not that it went away completely, it was a partial effect, it was a slowing down, it wasn't uh, um, Getting rid of uh, research Rafferty has conducted with adolescents uh, that were experiencing homelessness, followed them longitudinally and found uh, for, a, for a lot, not all, but after a year, but definitely after two or three years, that most, if not all, I, can, um, I think it was only a few, but almost all uh, the participants in that study showed almost a uh, complete bounce back um, that the, the effects, the negative effects, seemed to disappear in almost, uh, almost all of them, at least over three years. But even after just a year or two after the experience, um, there was a, a large diminishing of that effect. And so again, this suggests that the effect is a little bit more acute, um, but, I, but we're gonna look at chronic in a second, um, that it may be that during that experience or immediately around that experience, there's a, a large uh, effect. Um, also from a similar studies that um, Cullini did out of, uh, again, Minneapolis, what they found in terms of data, in the, and you can see here, sorry, this is not clear, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade going across the bottom, um, 
if you see the, the curves and the trajectories, the top line is general, the second line is the national norm and those that were in the, the reduced meal categories, the, the dots, the next is the free meal category, uh, and then the bottom is the homeless and the highly mobile uh, children that had that checkbox. So you can see that there is a difference that begins in the third grade and that continues over time. Um, so they, they continue with that. Uh, you may expect if this were just a continuum uh, and an acute effect, you might expect that um, this group here, the, the bottom line, would catch up to the next line above it, um, you know, ameliorating the, sort of the impact of uh, that homeless experience. Um, so there's evidence um, of a chronic or a long-term effect. Um, and over on the, the uh, right side over here, um, they found an effect um, that does support, and again, this is how they approach the analysis, um, that supported this sort of income risk continuum. Almost perfectly linear, this is a little bit off in terms of perfectly, but almost a unit uh, decrease uh, in risk as you move from those above 185 percent to those between 130 and 85, which are reduced lunch, and those uh, lower than 130 compared to those that are homeless uh, or highly mobile. So again, uh, in addition to acute, as I mentioned before, they're also showing uh, uh, income risk continuum possibly um, or chronic effect um, uh, in that. I do want to make a, a quick note about IQ. There was a few studies um, that included IQ. Um, these were the smaller studies, about three of them included this um, as part of their measure. They found, and, and in these studies, they found um, that there were difference between those that were homeless versus housed, um, but they did not find, I'm uh, sorry, they found that on the academic, but they did not find those differences on the IQ tests. Um, so this is just an example using Raven's progressive matrices. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's a test that's nonverbal and it's just about um, piecing together different matrices with pictures and with, with shapes and, and uh, patterns. Um, so it's a nonverbal one and it's not culturally based. It's supposed to be fairly um, uh, neutral in terms of, of bias. Um, they found that those that are housed were almost uh, identical, no statistical difference. A P is 0.92 is very, very um, non-significant. Um, so this implies, you know, and not to really get into IQ, but that the potentiality is not different um, for those uh, between groups, but that there are other things or other reasons that are resulting in the differences in the academic performance. Okay, so it's not that the, the children are, are um, showing lower potential, but they are in fact showing lower academic performance. Then they're, they're losing those skills. Um, so when thinking about those skills, um, how am I doing on time? Oh, that's it? Awesome. Um, so when thinking about those skills, um, we wanted to move to and talk about these or the other factors uh, in terms of protective factors. Um, so there is the flip side um, that those, as, as we'll see, um, those that have good school attendance are showing a positive effect. Those that have poor school attendance are showing a negative effect. Um, so I'm going to try to present these in, in more of the positive way to try to um, get the thinking and the, and the movement towards what can be done to sort of ameliorate the problems, but don't forget that the reason for those differences in academic performance may be exactly these, uh, these reasons that are here. Um, so uh, first note is that there's very limited information on this. There are not a huge number of studies that are exploring protective factors. Uh, as far as education experiences, and I'll show you that, there's really one study that has directly looked at it. Um, in, a, in a systematic way. There are a couple studies, but again, really one or two that have looked at um, executive function or self-regulation um, as, as, a, as a protective factor. Attendance seems to be the more common one, and we can guess why. When you look at administrative data, you get that number of absences column in the administrative data. It's easy to, uh, it's easy to, to analyze um, there. So again, and just to mention, um, when we think about risk, uh, going back to those 45% who showed resilience, um, it's a matter of balancing that risk that they're, they're uh, experiencing with these protective factors. And so if you have good parents or high quality parenting, that may tip the balance in the other direction so it's just that they're not showing the, the uh, detrimental um, effect. So uh, just quickly in terms of uh, attendance, um, many studies, again, most all of the large ones, all of the large ones, I should say, and many of the, the smaller ones even included an attendance um, variable and found that being in school, having higher attendance equaled higher um, school success. It's a, it's a simple, uh, simple equation. If you look at um, this study here, the, the data, um, 
Ruben found that about, um, there was about 14 and a half days uh, absent during uh, a given uh, school year, plus or minus 19, which is a very large range um, of standard deviation, um, that the homeless children were experiencing about 14 and a half days of, of absent uh, teaism, whereas those that were a, again, sociodemographically or fairly, this is the artificial sociodemographically matched, um, housed group were showing about uh, 7.4 uh, days absent. Um, we've done a lot of research with children in child welfare, with children in poverty and everything. When you get beyond six days absent, you can start to see a, a large detrimental effect that will start to occur in it, and it starts to become unit. Under six days, it tends to not have a, a large effect. So this is a huge uh, difference in terms of those that are experiencing homelessness. Twice as many absence, uh, and these studies found very large academic differences between those. Some of the studies, and if you recall, um, and, and one of the smaller studies that was presented is Buckner um, before, um, this was the study um, out of Worcester, uh, Mass. Um, he uh, did not find a difference between those experiencing homelessness and the housed um, sociodemographic counterpart. But as he also reported, he did not find any difference in absenteeism. So he didn't find that the number of, of uh, attendance uh, absence were, were different between those groups, suggesting that the lack of difference is possibly related um, to attending school or to getting to school. Okay, so one of the things that, um, again, just to reiterate, is good attendance seems to equal uh, higher, more resilience among those that are uh, experiencing homelessness. So something um, to keep in mind. Um, parent equality is another one, and this is a, un unfortunately, we had a question already about how this is measured. Um, I'm presenting Herber's uh, measure here as a recent um, study with 58 homeless children. And again, this particular study didn't compare it to others and wasn't really looking at the impact of homelessness on, but was trying to look at whether or not um, the different um, quality of parenting impacted um, academic success among those who are experiencing homelessness. Um, looked at closeness, warmth, positivity, uh, hostility, and then an overall or general quality um, measure. Um, there. I will just mention, again, it's a small study, and there was five questions of parenting quality asked to the parent, one for each of these. So it's, it wasn't a, an overly uh, rigorous study as far as the measures go. Um, and they also did a uh, teacher report to so just ask the teachers how the kids were doing. Again, not a very unbiased measure of, of success. Teachers tend to overrate those who are nice and well-behaved as being more academically successful. Um, they did also find that um, this was mediated by self-regulation executive function, which we're going to get to next. Um, so it seemed like, um, at least in this study uh, and two others, uh, found fairly similar results, that high-quality parenting was particularly protective um, for those who were in higher risk levels. So those that were experiencing more transitions, more mobility, um, that had a report of having more stress related to of the experience, um, and conversely, those that had the higher risk and low parent quality um, were found to be more vulnerable to the academic difficulties rated, in this case, by teachers as having a far lower um, that, uh, quality. So again, the way that the parent parents um, can really lead to and promote uh, the academic success, um, but again, act as a, a buffer um, to the academic success. So um, you can see some different pathways I just wanted to, to mention here. And the first one is really looking at the parent sort of as a teacher, parent as teachers, right? Um, so reading, talking to, direct instruction, specific instruction um, for children. Those qualities that parents have tend to lead to higher intellectual functioning, which tend to lead to higher academic performance. Um, in the next set, it's a lot about basically modeling and teaching and, and creating an environment in which you're promoting self-regulation, and that's that mediating effect. So the parent provides emotional support, indirect control of behavior, uh, models, teaches self-regulation, has consistent discipline, that's going to lead to self-regulation, which leads to a more focused um, school setting, more focused uh, outcome. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, folks will talk about warmth, enthusiasm, involvement in schools, so parents who are more and more enthusiastic and more involved in their child's schooling and their, in their child's lives in general uh, and care more about those things will have children who value um, school achievement and, and uh, have more enthusiastic uh, attitudes towards learning. Um, they'll have more positive relationship with teachers and peers and maintain motivation in school over a longer period of time. So these are just some pathways by which um, you know, parents and, uh, can help and promote uh, resiliency in, in children. And the last one I just wanted to cover 
uh, quicker than I probably <laughs> intended, but uh, is self-regulation. And so we think of self-regulation, uh, a classic sort of approach or definition is an, is an effortful activation uh, or an inhibition of, of behavior, cognition, or emotion uh, when governance of such domains is desired. So when, you know, uh, choosing between homework and play, you need to regulate and activate um, the less desirable um, option in that case. And not that I will go through it, but if you've ever dieted, um, this is a, a classic example. So the play may be the more prepotent response or, or dominant response, and homework may be the subdominant. And so children who have higher self-regulation are more likely to inhibit that stronger prepotent response for that um, a secondary response. Um, and just to mention this, a lot of uh, individuals will talk about this in terms of executive function. Um, this is really the neurocognitive system that allows for self-regulation, allows for that effortful activation and inhibition. Um, and this can be a top-down process, which is very conscious, very thoughtful, very effortful, um, or a bottom-up process, which is sort of instinctual or, or automated, um, as well as things that are emotionally charged or hot, um, and things that are neutral or cold. And I just wanted to mention that because, again, I think that people are experiencing a lot of adversity in their lives, like homelessness, may be more sort of hot in their, in their emotional reaction to things that others may approach in a more neutral way. And so they may have a lot more of this bottom up, this reactivity approach to things rather than in, engaging a more um, self-control or self-regulation. Those that have higher general executive skills or self-regulation uh, skills can sort of inhibit that and, uh, and move past that. So the, the study that Mastin conducted was looking at self-regulation, executive function, and these were inhibition and delay of gratification, um, cognitive flexibility, these kind of things, um, found that higher self-regulation led to higher academic competence, higher peer acceptance, higher pro-social behavior, um, both of which are also associated with higher academic uh, success, um, and also led to lower impulsivity or inattention and, and less aggressive or deviant behavior. Um, and so, as you can see here, this suggests that it may serve specific functions, particularly for, for children experiencing uh, homelessness, that, uh, to cope with high levels of novelty and consistency due to transitions. Lots of transitions. Um, children with higher uh, executive skills are able to deal with those a little bit more. Managing emotions, um, so again, being able to deal with the, the heightened stress, anxiety, depression, and other emotions that may be associated with homelessness. Um, and then they're able to adapt to teachers, cultures, rules, and other things like this a little bit easier. Um, so, so not approaching it with sort of that hard wall effect, but being able to uh, understand that things are different and that we have to adjust to a, to a new um, situation. I do want to just mention this. Uh, this is where Christina uh, and I are finishing. Um, uh, related to self-regulation, and, and I'll just go through this quickly, um, but just to make the point that not all self-regulation is equal, and we, we start talking about this as far as endogenous regulation and exogenous regulation, um, endogenous being that it generates from inside or it's internal things that I choose. So if I choose to regulate those emotions or I have ways in which I deal with uh, transitions for myself that help me cope, those are an internally um, triggered or internally uh, operated uh, regulation system. That's different from the exogenous. These examples here, don't eat the marshmallow, is somebody telling you how to, um, your response options. Teachers say this all the time, please raise your hand, don't blurt out. There's somebody from the outside telling you uh, these things. Um, I think this is important. Um, we've engaged in this level of research because uh, as you see in this previous slide, these things that are down here are all these endogenous, they should come from within. Yet, when you look at the studies, the actual tasks that they use, these are all external, exogenous tasks. So we've actually, and, and Chris, we don't have time, but <laughs> she can go through this if you want, um, did an, a very long uh, literature search before coming up with the task, but found that, uh, that there was absolutely no study we could find or task we could find that looked at how children were engaged in that. So um, what we, we developed a task um, that looked at that and have found, at least for children under four, that they're capable of either exogenous or endogenous regulation, but not both, per se. Um, some were, very few. Children over four could do both. And so it seemed like, based on parenting and based on rearing, some children are able to comply, if you will, have that compliant regulation, don't eat the marshmallow and they don't, whereas others, and again, it possibly due to the parenting, the rearing practices, are able to develop that internal system of regulation to cope with transitions and mediation and all these things. And so, Trying to uncover this and determine the pathways 
um, by which those uh, develop, I think would be really important, again, helping uh, sort of specify how children are uh, um, uh, aided in their development of self-regulation, I think would be uh, important. And lastly, um, early education. So um, uh, uh, Steingart uh, et al. in 95 um, conducted a, a, a non-experimental design study, but those that were in early education, those that weren't, among those that were experiencing homelessness, again approached uh, the children in shelters, and so some were going to an early education program and others were not. Um, and did find that there was improved school readiness and academic performance for those who attended early education. They also found that uh, in the housed socio-demographic match sample, the same effect. There was no difference between those experiencing homeless and not. So everybody, um, poverty and housed or homeless, both experienced an improved effect. Um, this, this implies, again, that it doesn't differentiate, and that's a good thing, um, but that early education experiences um, are going to be very helpful in terms of providing children with some stability, um, but also possibly the means by which they can develop these self-regulatory skills uh, and other skills um, that seem to be um, promoting and, and helpful for resiliency in this area and, and helping with uh, education, um, with uh, long-term academic performance. Very limited research, really the only study that looked at it systematically. Others did a, some basic correlation, but uh, didn't have a comparison group. So. And if you want a quick summary, <laughs> here it is. Uh, so there seems to be uh, children that are experiencing homeless face unique risk compared to their, their um, housed counterparts. Um, however, they may not perform significantly different on, on tests. Um, the housed, I'm sorry, homeless children perform significantly lower than the general population in early education and in elementary school. Uh, the effects of homelessness result in both acute and chronic uh, detriments to academic performance. Uh, and finally, it seems that parents, and just to put this together in a different way, parents who are, promote self-regulation and school attendance, the love of learning, other things like that, um, may also be able to promote, uh, excuse me, protect their children from negative effects and sort of promote positive uh, outcomes there. That is the, the end. I do want to acknowledge um, that we did have support from the Missouri Head Start Collaboration Office, um, and that Carolyn and um, Stacy Osley Wright also were very instrumental in putting together the ideas and thinking through the, the beginning of approach of this. So I want to thank them for that. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Mayor for your assistance.